Ladies and gentlemen, if we'll go ahead and settle down, we'll, we'll get started. There are a lot of committee meetings going on right now, uh, and uh, Chairman Royal and I were just discussing. Uh, he and I will both have to step away. Uh, just well, he for longer than I in, in the middle of uh, this one at 11 o'clock for a bill presentation in another committee. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started. I think we'll have probably additional members of our committee uh, come in. I've seen them uh, around this morning. I think they may uh, be coming in as we get started. Uh, our agenda this morning is to, to have presentations uh, on the 08 budget. Um, so we'll look uh, to uh, the departments to give us their presentation on the 08 and then ask the committee to follow up with questions. Uh, again, at 11 o'clock, uh, uh, Chairman Royal and I will have to depart just a few minutes before that, and I will be returning. Um, we have uh, the first item on the agenda, or the first group uh, on the agenda this morning, uh, Department of Law. If you guys are ready, we are. Better. <laughs> Sorry about that. I hope you all heard me at least. <laughs> the, um, the the pie chart basically shows you a breakdown by agency of where most of those outside council fees are expended, and you see by far the biggest single chunk of that, 41 percent, is spent on DHR related matters. That's primarily defects and child support lawyers that are located in every county of the state. Um, doing uh, that work. They do that work, I, I would point out, at a remarkably low rate of about 52.50 an hour. 
um, and that includes both uh, the, uh, the rural areas of the state and the metro area. So it's a uniform rate across the state. The second biggest chunk is DOT, which accounts for about 28 percent of the SAG bill. And again, that is uh, mostly property acquisition, condemnation related actions uh, dealing with highway acquisition and, and construction. Uh, the rest you see are just spread out among the various agencies. Uh, what we're trying to do is identify those areas where it makes sense for us economically to bring the work back in-house because we believe we can do it at about 50 percent of the cost we're paying outside lawyers to do this work. Um, it makes good business sense to do that and it um, really makes us less dependent on, on outside lawyers. The final chart I want to show you, which is, which is very important to us, gives you sort of a snapshot of the law department in terms of the experience levels of the attorneys who work there. If you look at the first uh, table on the top of this chart, you'll see a, a tenure range in various categories. And you'll see that 50 lawyers out of the 110 lawyers currently employed by the law department have five or less years experience. If you go to the uh, zero to ten year range and add those first two columns together, you'll see that almost 80 of the 110 lawyers in the law department have less than ten years experience. Uh, we are losing lawyers at an alarming rate, uh, uh, probably over 18 percent a year, um, primarily due to low salaries. And if we don't do something to improve the salary situation in the law department, we are going to lose all of our experienced lawyers. You'll note on this chart that on the upper end of the table, five of our lawyers who have the most experience in the office are already past their retirement date and frankly could have retired already but have stayed on because of their commitment to the office and to, to their public service. But below that level, we don't have many lawyers with experience, uh, long-term experience that we need to do the state's legal work. And if we don't do something to address that problem um, by improving salaries at the law department, we can never reduce our dependence on outside lawyers because we need to have experienced lawyers to do the complex work in the office. The really sad thing about this on the salary side is that the lawyers uh, that we see leave, a good number of them are leaving to other public sector jobs where they're paid more, other uh, in-house positions in state agencies in local uh, prosecutor's offices and county attorney and city attorney offices where they're actually paid more than they're paid in the law department. So we're not and have never asked that our salaries be made commensurate with private lawyers in the Atlanta area. Uh, we know that's just not realistic. Uh, I think many of you probably have noticed that some of the bigger firms in Atlanta have raised their starting salary to $125,000 a year. That's for lawyers right out of law school. And of course, we have 30-year lawyers who aren't making that much money. But we're not trying to compete with those folks. We're trying to compete with our colleagues in the public sector. And for that reason, we had uh, the Carl Vinson Institute at the University of Georgia do a study of our pay uh, situation. And we have given that in the past to the committee. And we've been asking for several years now that that, that, uh, that, that study be funded so that we can uh, deal with this retention issue. Because we firmly believe that if we can retain good, experienced lawyers, and we can add positions to the law department, the two things going hand in hand will uh, help us bring down this SAG bill, which is what we want to do. Uh, we need to be doing the state's legal work in the law department, not in private firms spread throughout the state of Georgia. And we're asking you then to uh, fully uh, recommend the governor's recommendation, which, which deals with at least half of this equation. His recommendation would add 20 lawyers to the law department which is probably the most significant increase we've seen um, in my tenure there of, of 23 years. But it's something that if we don't do now, we're just going to continue to fall further and further behind. And it's very important um, for just the, the legal business that the state does that we not fall further behind. To give you an idea, we have, I said, 110 lawyers. We only have 189 positions. We've, we've taken secretary positions, paralegal positions. We've basically cannibalized ourselves in order to create lawyer positions wherever we can because that's really the bread and butter of what we do. We have to have the lawyers. 
Uh, we have 110 lawyers. Some of our neighboring states, Florida has 466 in their attorney general's office. North Carolina has 233. Virginia has 193. Tennessee has almost 200. So just some of our, our neighbor states and states of similar size to us are roughly double the size of the law department in Georgia. So we see this uh, governor's recommendation, the increase of 20 attorneys, as basically a start to getting the law department where it needs to be to be able to do the legal work of the state. And with that, I would urge you all to support the governor's recommendation. And Thank you for your time, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. We have a few. Ms. Chamber. Thank you for being here. Appreciate it. Um, when, when you hire your 20 new attorneys, are you going to be looking for experienced attorneys, or are these just graduates from law school that you think you'll be recruiting from? We're going to probably do a mix. Um, we've run the numbers and determined how we can best use the dollars that we've been given to fill those positions. So it will be there will be some new lawyers. There will be some uh, probably five to ten year lawyers. Uh, so we'll get a mix of, of folks in. Okay. W with your chart that you're showing on your on your salary, w if you hire a lawyer that has, um, I guess, real world experience um, outside of government, do you, do you compensate them in in the amount on your scale of, of previous experience, or do they start in at the starting salary? No, no. We we hire primarily based on bar year. We set salaries mm -hmm. based on their bar year, their experience level. Okay. And the chart at the bottom of this handout, the last handout I gave you, kind of shows you where those salary break points are mm -hmm. at 5, 10, 15 years to give you an idea of, of what we're paying lawyers in those uh, okay. experience ranges. So, so the number of people you'll probably actually be able to fund will be somewhat determined by the experience of the lawyers who apply and who you, who you choose. So, so the number of 20 could be less if you're actually hiring right. a handful of lawyers that have more experience. Right, and the, the governor's recommendation actually recommends 20 lawyers, six paralegals, and three secretaries. And, and I think that was somewhat arbitrary in terms of the numbers, but we would uh, juggle those as best we can to get to maximize the additional positions. Okay. I guess. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Thank you. Um, could we get a copy of the breakdown from the Carl Vinson study on what the salary should be? Yes, sir. I don't think I've, I don't think I've seen that. No, I we we will be uh, glad to get that to you. We have furnished that I think every year for the last five or six years, and I'm not sure it went over in our package this year, but it should have. So we'll get it to you. Right. Some of us have been on other committees on appropriation about this, and, yes. and I think that when you look at the scale, we ought to look at where you are and where the study said it ought to be, and and see if we could help in some regard. We'll get that to you today. <clears throat> Are there further questions? I did just, if, <clears throat> and I know you can't give me a specific answer. I'll, I'll, I'll let you off the hook before I even ask the question. But um, with the additional item, 32.1.1, .1, which is where the governor's recommended the funding for the, the additional staff, and I think he's going to give you the latitude and that of the attorney generals uh, to decide you know, how best to staff uh, with those funds. Can you give us an idea of, of where you guys in, in the AG's office see that those folks going to work and what they're going to do? And, and I know there's not going to be a direct relation that if we do this, then the, the, the SAG bill goes down this much. But I guess what you want to make sure is that you don't add those those attorneys, that, that additional manpower into the AG's office and, and nothing happens. Uh, right. I, I mean, maybe we just decrease the increase in the expenses because the, you know we live in a litigious society. Um, do you have an idea of, of where those are, are headed at this point well, and, and an approximation of, of what you know, it would take to get them on the ground and you know, how much the decrease in the increase in SAG expenditures would be? The, the commitment we've made to the governor's office uh, going into this process was that we would strategically place all of these positions to take in SAG work. So we are not going to put them um, in divisions or sections doing work that otherwise would be going outside to private lawyers. So every bit of the work that these folks do, our intention is to offset work that would otherwise go outside. So we expect our savings uh, we would hope it to be uh, two for one. If we, if, if we get $2 million funded here and we can slow the growth in the SAG bill by $4 million, then we think we would have done a, a good job and demonstrated that um, we can do the work in-house for about half the cost that it, private lawyers are, are costing the state right now. Okay, and just a, a follow-up with that, if, if I could. 
when you you guys provide legal service, I mean, it, is it not true that you guys are the only lawyers that can represent the state of Georgia? I mean, yes. our other departments have attorneys, but as far as filing documents that are official on behalf of the state of Georgia, you're the law department. Is that correct? That's right. The as a matter of constitutional law in right. Georgia, we are the only lawyers for the state of Georgia. And, and Again, I'm new new to this appropriations committee. Was, was with Chairman Smith prior to. Tell me it, it, when departments make requests. Is there any way when they make requests to be represented by the AG's office? There's no transfer of funds. They don't pay you for your services uh, per in, se. In general, that is correct. The only place where that's not the case is in insured cases with DOAS. But for the, general day-to-day -day representation of the Department of Corrections or the Department of Juvenile Justice or whatnot, we are not reimbursed by the agencies. And, and, and I mean, it's state dollars, and I, I certainly don't want to advocate putting in a, a system of accounting that costs taxpayers dollars without a, uh, a benefit, but I, I would ask you to take back to the AG and, and perhaps get back to this committee for consideration over the summer. I, I just think when somebody can call your office and ask for an opinion or ask you to do things without any cost attached to that department, I would venture a guess that sometimes you, you get calls and inquiries and, and work to do that, that is not necessarily the most productive for an agency. If, if it's a free call, if you will, they make it. So I, I would be interested in feedback while from, from your office, from the department, and, and, and from the AG himself as to how we can somehow track that or keep, you know, I guess you probably do keep bill, you know, non-billable time, but time spent on tasks for, for agencies to make sure that since there's not a financial obligation of the agency to you, that, that you're working effectively for the entire state, not just being monopolized by an agency on a task that may not be the most beneficial. Right. Does that make sense? I mean, have you been asked that before? No, it does make sense. And we do actually keep stats, time stats on everything we do for all of our uh, client agencies, so we can certainly produce that kind of information on the other end. Uh, we've always been a little leery of, of discouraging certain agencies from contacting exactly. us, frankly, because we need to be able to give them that ounce of prevention and you know, pounding court, so to speak. I understand, and I don't want to dissuade agents, but it's just when there is no financial um, skin in the game, if you will, right. you, you wonder how many phone calls get made that, that perhaps not. I appreciate that. Um, sure. Chairman. Uh, yes, sir. I'm just curious. What percentage of your, your work is actually bid out to outside firms that are not state attorneys? Do you have an idea as, as far as percentage of the work, the workload? Um, I don't think I could give you. We could probably come up with a number. I don't think I have a number um, that yeah, I could. That, that's fine. I'm just curious if you, if you can do that, just, just sort of get an idea as to what's being sent out, what's being done in-house. Secondly, how do you actually determine, or how, how's the bidding process work? How do you determine who actually gets that work? Well, a lot of it is dependent on sort of expertise. We have work that goes out in, in, in several different uh, categories. The DFACS child support work and DOT work all goes out because it's, it's very local. You need people who know the, the local folks uh, who do the condemnation work, uh, who do the, the child support work and things like that. So all of that work goes out. So it's not necessarily done by price. It's done by expertise. Right. Right, or or geographic location. Uh, it, it falls into you know we have admiralty law, we have uh, SEC law that has to, we have to do in Washington and things like that that requires a unique expertise that we we couldn't hire anybody in house to do. Uh, we have other work that just because of the the nature of the work, the geographic location, it makes it impractical for us to do it. But then there's a category of work that's just overflow work that we would do in house if we had the bodies to do it. I guess it's the overflow work that's interesting to me. I'd like to know how much of the overflow work that you could do in house is actually being sent out. And th that's something that we could put we could pull some numbers together okay. for you. I think. Thanks. Many have further questions. How do you award these contracts to local lawyers? What process are you using? There really aren't contracts. Um, all of the special assistant attorney generals serve uh, under appointment by the attorney general, so it's a direct appointment. So these are, these lawyers that do you, that represent defects there. How do you get those lawyers that represent defects in different cases? Well, in most cases, they are recommended locally. 
the local DFAX office may say they have worked with these lawyers. We have lawyers out there that, that have worked with these lawyers, and so they will recommend them to us. We frankly don't have a lot of people beating down our door to do $52 an hour work, though. Lawyers, that's... Could, could we get... Could I, do you have a copy of the amounts y'all paid lawyers for DFAX? Yes. Okay. Yes. Certainly get that Thank to you. you. Thank you. Further questions? Have Further questions, the gentleman. Thank you very much. And, and I understand, I, I should have mentioned that earlier, that the Attorney General had contacted the committee office and let us know that his travel schedule wouldn't allow him to be here. We appreciate him letting us know that and understand you know, his commitment prior to the meeting schedule being set. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, the next uh, uh, group, we have uh, juvenile court judges. If they would come forward, and while you're doing that, I'm going to recognize Representative Freeman. Before you, you leave, uh, Representative Alan Freeman has a group, uh, a youth uh, leadership group in. That's the, the folks over here uh, on the side of the room that came to visit with us this morning. We, we welcome you guys and appreciate you taking the time to come up. Appreciate uh, Representative Freeman, you bringing them into our committee this morning. Absolutely. Thank you. Good morning. Please. Hi, I'm Kirsten Wallace. I'm the budget director for the Council of Juvenile Court Judges. I want to thank you for uh, having us here today. And um, our 08 budget is pretty much a continuation of our 07 uh, supplemental budget request. Um, just going over the document that the House Budget Office put together and pretty much just going down the line. Uh, we're analyzing the funds for the 4% raise that was effective January 1st, 2007. And we're analyzing the increase for the health care um, increase benefit plan. Um, we're asking to provide funds for 4% raise effective June 1st, 2008. Um, and we're asking also for the increase for the mileage reimbursement rate, which actually, I'm sorry. Um, asking for the uh, increase for the mileage reimbursement for our travel. Um, and then if you go down to the grants to counties for the judges' salaries, we're uh, asking for the Coweta County, which was uh, put in the budget last year, we're asking for that. And a 2% pay raise for the judges um, for the House Bill 334. And anybody has any questions? <laughs> Pretty small. Committee have any questions regards that if you're on our small tracking document, um, we're on page 11 of 71 uh, for the juvenile court. Anybody has any questions regards to this? I'm sorry? Seven of 22. I have a different. I have a different document. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm more. I'm sorry. I apologize again. I, I have a different. Uh, I have the whole document. It's not just our committee's document. No. We are on the 7.1. Right. Is, is the, That's uh, the number we're on? Those are the items that I went through. Yeah. Yeah, I have him. Okay. Um, all right, so 7 of 22 or 11 of 71, whichever document you have, it's the same <laughs> same page. Um, committee, have any questions? I, I think the, the only you know the only question, and we'll talk to you guys offline about this, is the you know, what, what was asked at the 07 is the 4 percent versus 3 percent for the other uh, departments within the state, and how we came we, by that number. We actually gave 3 percent. Our staff only received 3 percent January 1st. Okay. <clears throat> Further questions? You must have done a fine job. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm sorry, the next group, uh, the Judicial Council, if you would uh, come forward for your presentation. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, Kelly's handing out some one-pagers.
everybody get the handout. Uh, if you'll notice, we've gone through and up in the upper right-hand corner, we have numbered the document to go along with the tracking sheet. Um, as you know, Judicial Council has a lot of program budgets under the Judicial Council, so I have quite a few to go over. Uh, I'll try to go through them quickly, but if I'm going too quickly, just stop me uh, with any questions and I'll go back and give more detail because there is quite a bit of information. Uh, on the first sheet, uh, those are just the adjustments uh, carried over into continuation for the pay raise for 07 that we had in supplemental, the increase in the health insurance. Um, and the workers' compensation and the GBA rent increases. That just gives you some detail on how we arrived at those numbers. Uh, so that's 60.1234 uh, and 9 on the tracking sheet. Uh, the next is the Appellate Resource Center, which is 6 .1. Uh, They are asking for a total of 279340 an enhancement for 08. That will allow them to hire a paralegal and an investigator. Uh, we provided some, I have much more detailed information if you would like that in a separate handout, but it was quite lengthy, so I just kind of summarized for them. Uh, they've had a 40% increase in their caseload over the past seven years uh, with no increase in state funding. The next is the Judicial um, ICJE 632. Uh, they're looking to implement a court administrator certificate program. Uh, right now there is no formalized education for court administrators in the state and the National Association of Court Managers has developed 10 core competencies for court administrators. Uh, this would allow ICJE to provide that training to court administrators around the state where they could get certification as a court administrator. Uh, they're looking for one staff person to coordinate that effort at a $35,000 salary. Um, the next page, 632, that um, outlines the breakdown for those funds. I skipped over one, I'm sorry. 621 is the Office of Dispute Resolution. Uh, they, I wanted to note that the, the budget for this actual request was not loaded into budget net appropriately. It was loaded as 48204 and it should be 6839. That's for one staff person. Can I ask a question? Yes, ma'am. That's fine. I ideally like to let her get through the presentation. Okay. All right. Fine. You know that, no. Okay. That's No, not at all. Not at all. We'll go ahead and do that so that we can um, press your button, uh, Penny, and I'll get you. Uh, and this dispute resolution thing, what is alternative dispute resolution? Is this the same thing? It is the same thing. Well, uh, in the collection of fees, you've got $2.6 million in 05 in collection of fees for this department. For Office of Dispute Resolution? Right. Two point six four five five hundred fifty six point sixteen cents. What are you What are you looking at? I'm looking at the fees that were collected, the add-on fees to your fines. Those are local fees. Um, those are local fees that are collected at a local level to pay for those programs. The you office of the office the uh, this office of dispute resolution doesn't administer these fees. No, ma'am, they do not administer what? those funds. Those are local funds kept at a local level to pay for those alternative dispute programs. Yeah, they're sent into the state, and then how does that work? It goes back to the local. It, they're sent to the clerk's cooperative authority. I believe they're reported to the clerk's cooperative authority, but they're held at a local level to pay for those programs. Well, who oversees the programs? The Georgia Office of Dispute Resolution oversees the programs and they do the training and the certification of the mediators, uh, but they do not handle the local funds. Those local funds are kept locally uh, to pay for alternative dispute resolution at a local level. Thank you. Chairman Ralston, did you have a question? Yeah, Deborah, um, my understanding um, 
and I think mediation has 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 been wonderful in our court system. Uh, but but it's my understanding that every administrative judicial administrative district has a district office that sort of runs the uh, ADR programs in the various districts. Is, is that correct? I guess my a general question is what does this office do that those offices could not do just as well? Uh, I have Nikki here from the, Office of, the Georgia Office of Dispute Resolution and uh, I'll have her come up and answer the, the particular questions regarding what, the, what they do at the state level office. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. In answer to your question, Representative Ralston, what the Georgia Office of Dispute Resolution does that the local programs do not is that by the ADR rule adopted, the Supreme Court ADR rules adopted in 1993, um, the office is mandated to provide assistance to programs who are beginning, starting up programs, as well as programs who are expanding. Also, we have a credentialing process and a review process of qualifications for training to ensure quality control. So the off what the office does is an overall management of what the commission has mandated as their charge. And that's subject to the ADR rules. Sure. But I'm very impressed with what some of the districts are doing. The ones I'm familiar with are doing an excellent job. And I know they provide training, do they not? Yes, they do. Uh, so, office, so I guess I go back to my original question of what this office does that those offices could not do just as well. Well, all of the neutrals for the court annex programs have to be registered with the state. They have to go through a procedure whereby they have to take an approved training and they are monitored to make sure they have continuing education going forward. So we provide the, uh, the, the registration process for that. We also monitor that and make sure that the court programs, those local programs, have the registered mediators. According to the ADR rule mandate, any mediator in a court connected context has to be registered. So in addition to helping providing training, we're um, a policy making organization, a, a regulatory agency. But, but could we not also do the registration process at the district level? Well, it, it would be very difficult uh, to maintain the type of records that the office does with regard to mediators to maintain qualifications. We also do an audit on continuing education every year to assure that neutrals are complying with the regulations according to the ADR rules. It could be done at that level possibly, but, but not to the same degree. Um, it's an overall let reg regulating body, so our threshold would be the minimum for them to be qualified to be registered with the local programs. And, 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 I, and I don't want to belabor the point. I will talk about this some further as we go through this process, but, but it strikes me that, we, that it's, it is kind of redundant, uh, and, and we could have the districts do the same thing without – I mean, we've got a competition here for, for, for dollars, as you well know, within our judiciary, and, and, um, and, and so we – I'm wondering what, if we could take a look at, 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 at if whether we have some overlap here or redundancy. Well, I think that there are some resources at the local level um, that don't really affect what we do at the state level. Uh, as far as providing ADR stats, uh, we collect statistics from every local program. We have ongoing quality control initiatives to help uh, regulate and monitor the quality of programs provided to all of the, the, the state. But we could do that at the district level where we're under the supervision then of the judges in that and the courts in that district, could we not? I'm not really sure that, Representative okay. Ralston. Okay. Um, I, okay. According to our ADR rules, okay. we're mandated to provide these services. Okay. Thank you. I, I, um, that begs the question, and who makes those rules? Um, these are the ADR Supreme Court rules. I actually have copies here if you want. No, no, I was just curious. Like it, I, I, 
I'm just being a bit of the devil's advocate for. I wonder if the people that make those rules aren't trying to draw the power up to a state, centralized state, and away from the people. <clears throat> we, we can have the discussion. I appreciate you coming forward because this is new to me, and I, I know both of these individuals, um, you know, have have an interest in it. So we'll we'll probably want to talk to you more about that as we go. Thanks for Thank being here. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Thank Please. you. Okay, the next is 6.4.1, is the Judicial Council Standing Committee on Drug Courts. Uh, if, if I can, I, I want to back up because you, you did 6.3.2 and then we, we went back. Okay. Um, tell me real quickly, th to implement a court administrator, where would, this, where would we do this? It's done through the contract with the University of Georgia for ICJE, and right. that person would be housed there with ICJE at the University of Georgia. I think I had a conversation with a gentleman from Cobb County in regards to this uh, yes. particular yes. position, and, and we're, we're very interested in, in taking care of this. And, and in fact, had, had I've also had a conversation with uh, Chairman Smith mm -hmm. as to all the funding that the university gets, why this is not part of their uh, offering. I just wanted to make sure I was connecting the dots yes, here, sir. and this it is, is that program. It is part of ICJE through that okay. contract that we have with the University of Georgia. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the next is 641, which is the Judicial Council Standing Committee on Drug Courts 2008 funding request. We have uh, an enhancement request of $1.5 million for felony and juvenile drug courts um, and 600000 for DUI courts. Uh, last year, we have a we have a million dollars that the Judicial Council and Standing Committee manages in state funds that go out to drug courts and DUI courts around the state. Uh, last year, we, we handled that as a competitive grant program, uh, and the Judicial Council, by statute, is responsible for setting the standards and oversight of drug courts in Georgia. Uh, last year, we had a million dollars um, available for that grant program. We had $2.3 million in requests come in uh, for funding at the local level, and those requests were capped at $100,000 for a new court, uh, 50000 for a second uh, year funding or for operational funds. So that really doesn't demonstrate the actual need uh, because those requests were capped at those levels. Uh, we have several uh, superior courts that are interested in uh, implementing drug court programs uh, in the state and our goal is to have one in every judicial circuit. Uh, that's something the committee is really striving for. As you, If you look on the second page of that handout, uh, you'll see a pie chart there that breaks out the cost savings. Um, in a medium security prison, it costs $14,184 a year to house a prisoner in a medium security prison, $18,852 in a close security pr prison, but only $47.94 for a drug court participation. Uh, we're seeing a huge success and there's a huge cost savings uh, to the state as well as the families that that impacts and, and saves. Uh, almost uh, most of the drug court participants do have children. On average, they have two children apiece. Uh, we feel like that, that helps keep uh, preventive with deprivation proceedings. Uh, they're seeing a huge success in dealing with the methamphetamine problem uh, in drug courts. Um, that, that is one of the things that they're recommending uh, as a strategy to deal with the methamphetamine problem because there are so many children impacted by that. Um, the, the DUI courts are set up... Um, on the drug court model, uh, and Georgia really does have the premier national DUI court model. We're recognized as having developed the model for the nation uh, in the DUI court arena. Typically, those courts can become self-sustaining over a period of two to three years. So the, the funding that we have requested this year would be implementation funds for additional DUI courts. That, would you like for me to take questions after each one? That's fine. That Not at all. Jim Day, did you have a question? Um, actually, it was answered in, in the handout. Okay. I, I guess more specifically, I, I, I fully agree with you on the DUI court's success, and I'm curious as to where uh, the $600,000 enhancement might be distributed. We, Like I said, we have a competitive process, so those courts interested in um, – Implementing a DUI court program would apply. We have an open, competitive process where we announce the availability of the funds. 
and they can apply. So how would, how did you come up with this figure? That would, that would start approximately six new cores. Okay. Thank They're you. about $100,000 uh, annually for implementation. And typically what we've done is that's reduced by 25% over a three-year period. Uh, because DUI courts, typically DUI offenders are still employed um, and, and have something left, and they can typically pay for their treatment and their program fees. Uh, so eventually they do become self-sustaining. Thank you. You're welcome. Chairman, Chairman Day asked my question, uh, but I, this is a great program. Thank you. Yeah, I was going to follow up with that. We had the grants last year, yes, sir. It, it, and, and you've, um, I guess, you know, talked about in, in your two-page handout here, you know, the successes. I, I guess I would be, you know, interested if, if there are details, you know, in some areas that, that perhaps I, I want to make sure the people that got the money used it, you know properly yes, and, and I have no reason to believe they don't but I just I want to make sure that, that there are oft times grants that come from the state that, that go to, to set up a, a DUI court or a drug court that all of a sudden and we heard in here the other day that we're buying fax machines and that were purportedly to set that up so you, you're comfortable that the money that's been granted through this program is, yes, is on sir, the ground and modeled, working like it should be we have modeled this grant program on a federal grant program it's a reimbursement uh, mm -hmm. Grant. In other words, when they get the grant, we don't just send them sure. the money. There's an approved budget, and there are only, we don't pay for office equipment. We don't sure. pay for facilities. It's all, it's purely operational funds, uh, and so they it's done on a reimbursement basis, mm -hmm. on a quarterly basis. They have to send in their expenditures, and then we reimburse them for the cost. Is there any local match in, in setting any of that up? Is there any of that determination as to where the grant money goes? We, we, we require a local match. Okay. We do require a local match on the, on the, on the grant applications. Okay. Thank you. Further questions? Right. Thank you. The next is 6.4.2, which is the Council of Magistrate Court Judges. Uh, we talked about this in the 07 supplemental. This is just the continuation to purchase the Westlaw for the Council of Magistrate Court Judges. 6.4.3 um, is the updated guardianship video. We talked about this in the 07 supplemental. Uh, there was a change in the guardianship code. Uh, there, it, there was an existing video uh, that people came, who came into court could watch to, to find out about guardianship. With the law change, many of the things have changed and they need to do a new video. Uh, this uh, same amount was requested in the FY07 supplemental. If it is funded in the supplemental, we do not need it in the 08 budget. So it would, it's a one-time cost uh, that we'll need. 6.4.4 uh, is the Georgia mock trial competition. Uh, that will be coming to Georgia in May of 2009. The Council of State Court Judges uh, has been really involved with the mock trial competition in Georgia uh, in conjunction with the bar. This money would be used to, to put the down payment on for the facility uh, for the national competition that will be here in May of 2009. And it would be done in conjunction with the state bar. The next is 6.4.5, which is a enhancement request of 94279, which is a 4.5% increase in legal services for victims of domestic violence. Uh, th these, these funds are used for civil legal services uh, for victims of domestic violence. It is also distributed through a competitive grant program uh, that is overseen by the Judicial Council um, Domestic Violence Committee. Uh, so people apply for these funds and they're used strictly for legal services for those folks going to, some of them are through a shelter, some are through Atlanta Legal Aid, and some through Georgia Legal Services. Uh, this, the increase in that would help them serve an additional 257 clients uh, over the next year. 6.4.6 .6 is the Georgia Courts Automation Commission. Uh, George Nolan, who's the Executive Director of the Georgia Courts Automation Commission, is here. Uh, what is the committee's pleasure? Would you rather me go through the rest of mine and have him come up afterward? Okay. Yes, besides, the, several other committees are going on at the same time, which is why we're seeing some folks go in and out. So uh, unless I see, um, well, I did see a question like come up. So uh, 
Once we do, we'll just kind of play it by well, ear. Well, you know, I'll be more than happy to answer whatever question. Okay. Uh, um, Representative, who's number se who's number seventeen? Is that Representative Day? Okay. Yes, uh, why do we need the Automation Commission? I'm, like I said, George Nolan, who's the executive director, is here, and he's going to come up and give you some detail about their mission and what they do and their budget requests. So I was going to work through my portion of it. I'd be more than happy to have him come up now if you'd like for me I, to. I'd appreciate it, and uh, Ms. Chair, I appreciate the opportunity to ask questions as we go along. Okay. Uh, I, I like doing it as we go along, too, so it keeps us on subject matter Certainly. anyway. So, yes, if you don't mind, Ms. Nesbitt. Here he comes. Thank you. I guess it's Madam Chair and members of the committee. What I gave you was a copy of the request 408. There's two items on there. Let me address the question that was asked, why do we need the Courts Automation Commission? When it was created, there was an exploratory group in 1990 that looked at the automation needs of the, of the court on that committee, when we drew that circle, we drew it wide so that there were lots of people involved in that. <clears throat> Senator Charlie Thomas, Representative Charlie Thomas, was on that committee, and Senator Jake Pollard was on, on that group. And when we took a look at the needs of the courts, what the courts needed as far as technology was concerned, there was no central place for the courts to come and get the help that they needed as far as technology was concerned. There is... Uh, the Courts Automation Commission exists for that purpose so that there is a central place for the courts to come and, and look for the technology needs. Um, today, it was, if you look at the legislation that created us, it was two phases. When we, when we began in 1991 officially through legislation, the commission, there were, there were 110 Superior Court clerk's offices who had no automation at all. And a lot of the courts had no automation. Today, there are, I think there's absolutely no court out there that doesn't have some type of automation. We didn't accomplish that on our own, and, and rightfully so. There were other groups that helped us get there. It doesn't make any difference how we accomplish it. You, know, you, you get there any way you can. And so there are a lot of people that helped us accomplish what, introducing automation to the courts. Once that was done, it's almost like having the cart before the horse. We put the automation in the courts, and now we're going back and addressing the second part of that legislation, and that is to establish the policies and standards and procedures to govern that automation that's already in place. What uh, do you mean by govern? Well, if you have automation out there without any standards and policies and procedures to govern it, it runs amok. People do whatever they want to any way they want to. One of the, let, me, let me give you an example of that, and I don't, I don't mean this derogatorily. But information that's now being moved from those local courts to the state, information that the, this commission, this committee needs, for instance, uh, who knows whether or not you're getting the information that, that you need. One of the things we're looking at here today, uh, the commission is working to achieve, is to make sure that the information that is moved upstream from the local court to the state is not just data, but it's valid data, that there are standards established so that the data moving forward is valid and comes to you in a, in a standard format and not just data that comes to you, I'll use the term willy-nilly. That's possible now because we have something called XML, a standard language that allows us to move data around uh, from court to court and from, from courts to state agencies and within agencies within, within courts. So we have a product now that we didn't have back when we started. So that enables us to set these policies and standards and procedures in place. Did the superior courts not develop their own uh, system, like online system, or are we talking about two different things? Clerk's Authority has an online network that they use, but that's, that, you go back and look at the legislation for that, and it deals directly with deeds and indexes. Um, is this... 
But what you're doing now, is it in concert with this umbrella of programs that the governor's office is uh, putting together that aims to, to uh, make virtually all the courts and law enforcement uh, agencies uh, more streamlined by having uniformity in, in one system? It will, it will sync up with that at the appropriate time. The challenge currently is that we must be able to share data within the courts themselves. We don't do a very good job of that currently. Uh, moving data from court to court, because courts have different case management systems, they don't share data with each other very well. So in order for us to give the state what it needs and cooperate with the governor's view of, of sharing data, we need to be able to share data with ourselves first. So that's what we're, we're about now is the, is the sharing of that data, the standards and policies and procedures within the courts. But in so doing, that doesn't mean that we're simply just addressing sharing data within the courts. We're doing it using that XML language so that when we finish that, we will be able to take the next step, and that is share that data with state agencies. I don't understand why that would have to precipitate what the governor's trying to do. It isn't really, and I'm sorry if it sounded like that when I said that. It's, it's, it will, it will mesh together. There will, it will not happen at one time, but it will, it will be seamless when it does because of the XML. The answer to your question is yes. Okay. Okay. Any other questions from the committee? I don't see any of the lights on. Thank you. Okay. Why don't you sit right there just in case? <laughs> An experienced presenter here. <laughs> <laughs> Please, Ms. Nesbitt, if you would continue. Okay. Uh, 6.4.7 is the Council of Probate Judges, and it mirrors the Magistrate Court Judges continuation of the 07 supplemental request for $20,000 for them to have Westlaw for all of their judges and staff. Um, Ms. Nesmith, do you have to do a separate Westlaw um, subscription for each level of the judiciary? Is that we how that are works? working to do one contract. Uh, right now, the Council of Magistrate Court Judges and the Council of Probate Judges, they do share a contract. But because of the way our budget lines are set up, we split that cost between those two councils so that you all know what you're paying for. Okay. Uh, but there is one contract for both of those. Okay, thank you. 6.4.8 uh, is, again, the Georgia Courts Automation Commission. Uh, it's their 08 budget enhancement request of 371688. Um, there's detailed information there. Do you want to hear from Mr. Nolan now as to the breakout of what that money will be used for? Only if a committee member requests it, and I don't see any lights on. Thank you. Or do you want to say, okay, well, Chairman Day has questions. No, I'd like to hear him explain it. Okay. Um, Chairman Day has asked for a, a brief explanation of the, of the breakout of those costs, please. As is reported to you on the first page of the information that I gave you earlier, the 27000 and Judge Pape apologizes, the chair of the commission apologizes for not being with you. He's on the bench and could not change his caseload today to be with you. So I'm having to address this. And this first item is, is a bit touchy because it's my salary we're talking about. So no. It's above my pay grade, but I'll try. The, the first item deals with funding the remaining part of my salary being transferred as it's a result of transferring my position from AOC to GCAC. So that's why that money's in there. The large increase, $343,000, deals with the development of those standards and the architecture to 
develop this data exchange that will come so that we can transfer and exchange data with the, within the courts and also with the state. We have identified some 5,000 data elements uh, within the courts that are not exactly common, but we reduce that down to 1,600. And we probably will finish with somewhere between five and 700 common data elements that we will exchange between courts and also be able to share data with, with the state. We did that by having six or 12 different sessions with, with these councils of courts to develop a standard for them or develop a uh, strategic technology plan for each class of court as well as a data definition so that we could understand the data that they <laughs> that flows into their court, through the court, and out the other side. So we had to understand the animal before we could ever address it. This particular, this funding will take us to the next step, and that is you take that information and you refine it down, finish refining it down, and also do that data mapping that I was talking about. Uh, and we're not going to do that by hiring a, a large staff of people. We're going to contract with someone to do this for us and to do the mapping, and then we will be ready again to move forward and share that data. Are you asking for funding on that in here? That's the 343000 And uh, if I heard you correctly, you've not bid it out yet. We have, we have not bid it out. So how did you come up with this number? We're looking at using the existing, the people that did the strategic planning for us and did the data definition facilitation for us. We would like to use the same people and plan to use the same people. If we change horses in the middle of the stream, you'll lose continuity. So they gave you a number? We looked at their hourly rate and have come up with a number. Based, based on the steps it will take and the time that it will take to get this done. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Oh, you're welcome. Any further questions from the committee? Okay. Um, what number are you, Ms. Houston? Seventeen? Okay. Or seven? So okay. I'm sort of confused now. The, the 343,000 is 6.4.12. Is that right? I don't. The 300, yes, ma'am. Okay. And, and that's administered by, by your agency? Yes. And this is for five classes of trial? It's actually for the five, five classes of trial courts plus the municipal courts. So it covers the six classes of courts. It says that in your documentation, I guess, because there are only five trial classes of courts in Georgia. But don't forget about the municipal courts. They exist okay. also. Okay. And, and I'm looking right here afterwards, you know, after some of these things, it's got GCA, GCAC commission. And this has got... AOC, the administrative office of the court. So these things, these two, are they one of the same? I, I, they're, they're not. GCAC is a separate state agency created by the legislature, but we're under the Judicial Council. We're attached to the Supreme Court. But the well, why, why by the, that do you have AOC by that? I would imagine that's because, and maybe one of these folks can a answer that question, I would imagine it's because they are our fiscal office. Okay, but you didn't have that up on your, okay. Maybe that's just, yeah, it's a, a misprint. Yeah. It should be GCAC? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Okay, all right. Okay. Uh, I have to correct two documents for the, for the okay. subcommittee chairman, so. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, any other questions from the committee on these expenditures? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. And to Ms. Nesbitt again. Thank you. Uh, 6.4.10 is the County Municipal Probation Advisory Council. Again, we talked about this in the 07 Supplemental. Uh, there was legislation passed last year. Um, the County Municipal probation, probation Advisory Council oversaw private probation services in Georgia. Senate Bill 44 that was passed last year uh, expands that umbrella to include the oversight of city and county operated probation entities. Uh, and so in actuality, this council is now overseeing all misdemeanor probation uh, services in Georgia. And what we have one staff person uh, that has been handling that 
and with this increased workload, we are requesting four additional positions. Uh, all of those entities and companies have to register with the council on an annual basis. We run criminal background checks and they apply and we check out their credentials uh, to approve them to operate in the misdemeanor uh, probation field. Uh, what we have are three compliance officers uh, and one administrative person. Uh, these folks would be going out into the field looking at the contracts that these companies have with the individual courts to make sure that the companies are complying with the contracts. Uh, we collect data from all of those companies as to how many how much in fine collections they have, how much in fee collections they have, and what their caseload is. Uh, we provided some data in the handout, and I won't go over that point by point unless someone has specific questions. No questions? No questions. Well, oh, never mind. Here we go. Uh, Chairman Day. Uh, forever the student. Um, why, why are you getting involved with uh, uh, probation? This council has been uh, administratively attached to the Administrative Office of the Court since 1997 when the legislation first passed to allow private companies to provide probation services. And the council is just administratively attached to the AOC by statute. Is there any reason, to your knowledge, why it shouldn't be a function of um, um, the corrections? That has been thrown out before. Um, you know, one of the reasons I think that it was administratively attached to the AOC is because probation services are so integral, integral to the operation of a court, particularly at this level, uh, when you're talking about probation services and folks that are put on probation, uh, that there's some judicial involvement on how those services are overseen. That is strictly a policy decision, though, of the legislature. Uh, as to whether or not it should be with the Department of Corrections, but it has historically been administratively attached to our agency, um, and we have provided the staff and the support to the council. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Any further questions? Okay, we can continue. 6.4.11 is the uh, Child Placement Project 08 budget request. Again, we talked about this in supplemental. Uh, this are, these are two positions that we are requesting for an expanded program for the Child Placement Project, which is has to run through there's federal dollars that are allocated to the states, uh, and the program has to be attached to the Supreme Court to improve uh, court processes in juvenile court in regard to child abuse and neglect cases. Uh, what we're requesting are two positions, and we've outlined what those positions are for. Uh, the, these state funds will serve as our match for that federal grant program. There's a 25% state fund match uh, to pull down that million dollars. So that funding will be available for the next five years, and we feel like this is a long-term project and that this will allow us to pull down the maximum amount of money for Georgia to deal with those child abuse and neglect cases. Questions? And uh, the next one was the Georgia Courts Automation Commission, but you've already talked to George Nolan. He's explained their 08 budget request. Uh, the next is 6.4.13 is a staff attorney for the Child Support Guidelines Commission. Uh, the commission is administered. We, we staff the Child Support Guidelines Commission through my office, and we do that through a um, interagency agreement with the Office of Child Support Recovery, and it allows us, if we provide the 34% match, it allows them to pull down 66% of the total cost of staffing the commission. Uh, that is for 4D cases, which are the welfare cases that are on child support. The commission last year passed, in the, in the child support bill that passed last year, it expanded the duties and the roles of the Child Support Guidelines Commission to functions outside 4D cases. So the Child Support Recovery has determined that many of the things that the staff attorney for the commission is required to do by statute are outside the boundaries of what we can use 4D funds for. Okay. So for example, dealing with pro se issues uh, that are not on child, you know, that aren't going through the child support recovery system. 
Uh, so dealing with those issues and educating the judges on all of the child support guidelines may not always be directly 4D related. And so in, in a cautionary stance, we have asked for the staff director's salary to be covered with state funds. We can use that as match to pull down additional resources for the Child Support Guidelines Commission. But this would enable her to do the commission's work that goes outside the 4D realm of responsibility. Okay. Any questions? Nope. Uh, 6.4.14 uh, is an AOC information technology request. Uh, we are requesting three software support specialists. Uh, the proposed are districts 2, 3, and 7. Uh, there's been a definite shift toward a need for field techs with networking, debt disaster recovery, and software programming skills, uh, as well as a working knowledge of the various case management systems that are out there operating in the courts. Uh, these folks actually go out into the districts and assist the judges with their case management systems, with their networks, their web pages, and a variety of things, particularly um, data that has to come up to the state level. So they're kind of on the ground people. They're also helping the judges with the new child support guidelines calculator. Um, there have been some problems with some of those, the network dropping off, and so these folks are trying to assist the judges in making the calculator work. Um, any questions about that particular request? Okay, 6.4.15 is a request, for another technology request for one developer and one project coordinator. This is for the AOC's traffic management application. Uh, there is a new federal mandate that all citations should be electronically submitted to the Department of Driver Services within 10 days or we will lose federal highway dollars. One of the, we have to this position has historically been funded through a grant program from the Governor's Office of Highway Safety, but that funding has, has come to an end, um, and it's the, the, from, the federal, uh, from the federal level. Not that the Governor's Office of Highway Safety took it, it's just from a federal level it's come to an end. <laughs> no, we've talked to Bob Dallas. <laughs> Bob Dallas is our friend. Um, and so what, what this system does that the, that the AFC put together is that this is a case management system that's put into some of these smaller traffic courts around the state who really don't have the resources to go and purchase a case management system. It's web-based, so we can provide technical support to them via the web uh, from our office. We don't have to necessarily go out to the court uh, to, to assist them with any problems that they have. And for those who aren't using uh, our case management system, we're providing technical assistance to those courts so that they can transmit from their existing case management systems into the Department of Driver Services their citations. Uh, so eventually there will be no more paper copies, uh, bundles of paper copies going to the Department of Driver Services where one of their data entry people have to then. So it will uh, eliminate a duplicate effort on, on, on posting those traffic citations. Uh, so we need a developer for that and a project coordinator who is a help desk kind of person uh, that's answering questions and helping courts get online. We right now have 63 production courts uh, that have just started using the case management system and they need daily support um, in trying to convert their data and learning to work the new case management system. Any questions about that? Uh, 6.4.16 is for an additional database administrator for the AOC. Uh, we've become the keeper of a significant portion of the judiciary's data, and it's really important that we have the necessary uh, staff there to help support those. Uh, we have six production systems um, databases right now. There are 323 courts utilizing applications and 75 additional sites uh, pending uh, testing installations. Uh, if you flip over on the back of that page, the 6.4.16 at the bottom, it lists for you the number of databases and types of databases that we are supporting through our office, and we right now have one database administrator. Uh, so not only is that administrator supporting the AOC functions, they're supporting databases out in the field in the courts. I've got two more, and then I'm going to be done. I know you're tired. Do you have a question? Okay. Madam Chair, I, I'm a little confused as to why um, in this day and age, I mean, we've been trying to get everybody automated for a long time. I know 
in the 13 years I've been here. Um, I know that we still have some systems who can't talk to each other, but at this day and time, is there any reason why uh, your efforts to automate with the other program, why can't there be more uniformity in the uh, development of programs? Well, we do work very closely with GCAC. In other words, the, the case management systems that we create, you know, we're working in conjunction with GCAC to make sure that they meet the standards uh, that they're working on for data exchange. Uh, these are more on the ground um, working positions that assist the actual local courts in the actual function of their case management systems and providing IT support directly to the courts. Whereas GCAC is more of a policy setting body who are setting the standards. I'm talking about case. the Automation Commission. That's the Automation Commission. They're, they're, they're more of a policy making body uh, who are coming up with the standards by which these case management should, uh, systems should operate. I, I, I hate to be a, a, a again, the, the ongoing student here, but, but do the standards change that frequently? That, They're that developing the standards right now, and, and in some ways they do. And I'm not a I'm not a technology expert for sure, but an example is every time a court fee changes, there there are uh, programming changes and standard changes around a court fee change. If there's one added, if there's one changed, if the calculation is changed, there's a whole lot of work that has to go into accomplishing that through case management systems and standards. I'll, I'll get with you later on, on this. So. Did you have a question, Chairman Knox? No, thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? For, all right. Um, <laughs> all right, you're number seven again. Okay. Okay, 6.4. Oh, did somebody else have a question? I'm um, sorry. Yes, Representative House can have one. I just wasn't after it, but I thought you were through. I'm okay. sorry. Uh, 6.4.16 are three research positions. Last year, if y'all remember, we took a large budget cut, and we had three research positions that were not filled uh, at the time, and we did not fill those positions. But really, research uh, functions go to the core of our mission uh, mm -hmm. at the AOC, and so we're requesting the additional funding we need to bring that back to full funding uh, for, the, for the upcoming year. And they do case count. Uh, do research projects for the local courts uh, and those type things. Okay. Uh, the Judicial Qualifications Commission, which is 6.5.1, uh, they've had a significant increase in their caseload. There is a chart there that shows the complaint activity. They're requesting an additional paralegal and an investigator to help handle, uh, JQC handles complaints against judges. And so they're asking for additional staff. Okay, that um, we'll have. Well, Chairman Knox pushed his button first, and then we'll get to uh, Representative Halston. How many cases do we have on file with the, with the Judicial Qualifications Commission? I mean, a number of years ago, I checked, and I think there were three, and none of those were acted on. Well, I don't know about the number of cases, but we start, we have the number of complaints that they get that are outlined here. It shows, you know, in 2005 there were 813 complaints. So I'm not sure about the active cases. I can try to find that out. Anything further, Chairman Knox? Okay. Representative Halston? Uh, 6.3.3, increased funds for the University of Georgia contract for additional training to increase funds. How much do you spend total on the training? For the judges, for their total budget, um, um, with the University of Georgia. Vince, what is that total contract? contract is about $485,000. $485,000. $485, and that's for the judges? That's for all levels of court and some court personnel, uh, court clerks. Is that, when, when, if we gave you an increase, it would be. Uh, That four hundred eighty-five thousand plus what you're adding for increase of one hundred ninety-nine thousand. Yes, ma'am. And the next thing is six point three point two uh, funds to, uh, to 
increased funds for a position to administer is that 127,000 is that one position? Yes, ma'am, that is one position. And then the is that, uh, uh, what are the qualifications for that? Because the funding's not been secured, they have not set the qualifications. It would be like a program coordinator that they would uh, keep track of the credit hours and who had certification and those kind of things. And there's one you asked for increased for a lawyer and somewhere in here, didn't we talk about a, a child support guidelines yeah. staff attorney? Right, and it was not making as much as this person. So well, no, this is for a $35,000 position. If you look at 6.3.2, there's a breakout of what the expenditures would be. There's printing and publication. There's um, six point. Now, tell me what I need to it, The page looks like this. What's on the? Oh, I was looking at the tracking sheet. Okay, yeah. The on tracking sheet said per position. Right, it's one position, but there are other costs. Uh, that are in there for printing and uh, office space, computer equipment, okay. those kind of things. It's a thirty-five thousand dollars a year. Just going by the tracking document. Yeah, it's Thank a thirty-five thousand. The your child support guideline staff attorney is just for the salary, not for any kind of office expense or anything okay. like that. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Are there any other questions from the committee? See no further questions. Thank you, Ms. Nesbitt. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Did a good job. Okay. Uh, next, we go on to the Superior Courts, and I know I recognize two judges that either were or are in the audience. Uh, judge Boggs is trying to hide back there in the back, and I uh, saw Judge Wong from my very own DeKalb County earlier. So uh, I guess he stepped out to go talk to some of the firefighters. But it's good to see. Are there any other judges in the in the audience? Oh, here's one, please. Oh, I, I can't see him. If you're not adjudicating in DeKalb County, I might not recognize you, so <laughs> if y'all wouldn't mind introducing yourselves so we could um, make note that uh, who, who you are. Next please, follow on the background. Okay. Hi, Judge Arch McGarry from your adjoining county, Henry County. Well, welcome, gentlemen. It's a pleasure to have you here. And we have Judge Mike Boggs. Oh, yeah. Like yeah. Ross. Yeah, Judge Boggs, um, there must not be a lot of crime or anything going on down there in your, your circuit. Cause it's good. Good to have you here this week with us, and <laughs> it is a pleasure to see a former colleague back up here. So, um, are you here? I'll be right back. Okay. Thank you for being here, and Thank let's you. start looking. I think we're on page 10 of our tracking documents. Um, what I had is page 14 of 71. But, uh, I'm Billy Boyette, and I'm a Superior Court Judge in Dalton. Georgia, and I'm the president of the council of Superior Court judges this year. Congratulations and, and welcome. You've, you've met our, our president-elect, Judge McGarity, and uh, Judge Baldwin, and uh, Judge Boggs are former members of the legislature, and they're up here uh, in support this morning. Uh, I want to introduce our executive director, Sandy Lee, and okay. our budget administrator, Tom Merriam, and we have Jody Overcash, who is our district court administrator for the 7th District. Uh, I, I would like to talk about uh, three items in our 08 budget that uh, that are in the nature of enhancements. Uh, the first one is uh, uh, line 10.3.1. I hope I've got the same sheet of paper that you all are looking at. I think we just have just the ones for the subcommittee. I think yours probably has everybody. And okay. but yes, we're on. Um, we have the same new numbers. That same we numbers. Yes, okay. sir. <clears throat> this is uh, for fifty thousand dollars, and this would be in the nature of a one-time item. And this is for uh, some education. As you know, uh, uh, courts are, are are since last March are very uh, security conscious. Uh, we're trying to uh, uh, not only uh, have some additional security measures, but we're trying to learn what to do in the event of one of these emergency situations and that would be the purpose of this appropriation. It would allow uh, uh, some education for our courtroom staff in procedures and technology that we need to ensure the safety of the people and the property in our courthouses. <clears throat> it would be uh, taught to help these folks know what to do in the event of some emergency situation. Uh, the education be offered on a district basis with post-certified instructors and would cover the cost of facility rental purchase and reproduction of instructional materials and reimbursement of instructor expenses. And as I say, that would be a one-time uh, expense item. 
the next item that I'd like to address is uh, is found on uh, uh, line 10.4.5. <clears throat> Currently, we have 65 uh, law clerks or law assistant positions for our 197. Uh, our 69, I believe it is, 69 law clerk positions for 197 Superior Court judges. Uh, I've been on the bench since 1983, and I can tell you that uh, uh, we are uh, on the bench in the courtroom a lot more now than we uh, ever used to be. Uh, as a result, it's, uh, uh, it's essential that we have some help doing research uh, for uh, uh, primarily civil motions, but other matters that come up that we can't resolve uh, uh, in an instant. And uh, this is what we need these folks for. We do have a lot of Superior Court judges that don't have a law clerk, uh, and uh, it results in a delay uh, in, in getting a case disposed of when you're on the bench all the time and you don't have time to sit down and do the research. So that's uh, we're asking for 10 additional uh, law clerk positions to try to close that gap. Uh, what we have now is about one law clerk for every 2.85 judges. Uh, so we're hoping to get your help in that respect. The other item is on uh, line 10.4.7. This again is a one-time uh, uh, expense item. This would be uh, on a grant basis, it's $1.5 million, and that would be used to assist in defraying some of the hardware expense uh, that might be incurred for complying with uh, Senate Bill 462, uh, which was passed last year, uh, which uh, provided that the sheriffs would be in charge of security at the courthouse. They are to develop security plans. And, uh, of course, many times these uh, plans are going to call for the installation of x-ray machines, uh, metal detectors, and stun belts. Uh, and a lot, of, a lot of our counties simply don't have those things now, uh, or they have some and don't have others. And uh, uh, this would work out to be something uh, uh, a little less than $10,000 uh, for each of the counties. Uh, some of the counties, of course, the metro uh, counties, perhaps won't need any assistance in this respect, but some of our more rural counties uh, do need it. Uh, for benefit of any of you that don't know what a stun belt is, that is a device that's uh, uh, placed on a defendant uh, when a defendant has uh, uh, shown cause that uh, there might be a threat to uh, to some sort of violence in the courtroom or, or disruptive behavior. Uh, it's, uh, the beauty of it is that it can be worn underneath the uh, uh, clothing so that it's not visible to jurors. It's not like having handcuffs on the uh, defendants. Uh, there is a, a deputy who, of course, has to have some training in the operation of that uh, device who sits in the courtroom with a uh, buzzer in his, uh, or a button in his hand and he can activate that uh, stun belt uh, if the need be, and it uh, will uh, incapacitate the uh, defendant immediately. Uh, the defendant, of course, is uh, uh, told about what the outcome is going to be, and, and uh, uh, it has a dramatic effect on their behavior. Uh, I had a, a case where... <laughs> Sir? It is. It is. Uh, the, the difference is, is there's nothing flying across the room. It's just on this defendant. And I had a case where a defendant was unhappy about uh, our rules of procedure that uh, he wanted to give a closing argument in addition to his court-appointed lawyer. And uh, I declined his uh, request to do that. And he became very angry at, uh, at what I did. And he flipped over the table and a uh, great big old table and the, fly, uh, the papers and everything went everywhere and scared everybody to death. I sent the jury out and the uh, deputy put the belt on him, explained how it operated, and while the jury was still out, I asked him uh, did he believe that uh, he could modify his behavior so that we could continue with the trial. He says, well, Judge, I'll have to. If I don't, y'all will electrocute me. So <clears throat> I didn't argue with him, and he was very well behaved. Uh, now, his uh, lawyer, uh, 
that for the rest of that trial did not stand as close to him as he had previously. Uh, and uh, so, but it is a very effective uh, device. Problem we have in our circuit, for example, is that we have one stun, stun belt for two counties, and of course you can't just let the other county borrow the sun, stun belt because the person that's working that button has to be trained to operate it. Uh, otherwise, you'll have some unintended consequences if uh, if the deputy dozes off and hits the button, and then the defendant goes down and he hasn't done anything. For attorneys, well, it would be uh, uh, it would. Uh, there are a lot of judges that would approve that. In fact, if we could work out a way to have a remote control for attorneys, and we could hit that mute button, that would that would be great. So, uh, but the purpose of this grant would be to help uh, with uh, uh, the counties complying uh, with those uh, security plans. As I recall that bill, uh, it didn't require any hardware. It more or less asked of local courthouses, uh, the sheriffs, the judges, to more or less get together and uh, come up with a security plan. There had been a turf battle in some cases uh, between who's in charge, and that was uh, what we were trying to fix with that bill. And there's been another rewrite of that bill that just passed the House, right. uh, which in my opinion is a little bit more clear. Uh, but is this going to be like for the type devices that you're describing or well, the implementation we, of coming up with uh, uh, security plans? Well, uh, Like how do you evacuate a judge if, if, if there's a problem or employees and things of that nature or securing a perimeter? Um, well, the plans would have uh, uh, those plans. Uh, in, in the plans, there would be a procedure for that. However, uh, I'm sure that uh, the security plans would all have uh, for those courthouses uh, where there are no metal detectors. And we still have courthouses, you understand, uh, where there's no metal detector. There's certainly no x-ray machine. Uh, I've got two in my circuit with no x-ray machines. Uh, and no stun belts. Uh, in other words, no security at all. And uh, uh, the, the, the notion of security uh, for a lot of uh, our counties, and this is the way it was years ago, uh, is, is you do it on a one-time basis. That is, if you're having a big case, then you have security. Well, unfortunately, uh, the danger is usually not in the big case. The danger usually is in your run-of-the-mill domestic case, for example, where the feelings can run so high. So. By the way, I like your time. Well, thank you. Thank you. I like yours. Thank you. <laughs> Carry on. That's, uh, that's all I was going to talk with you all about. Now, the rest of the items in our budget are or uh, annualizing uh, uh, things that were just continuation type items, but I'll be glad to try to answer any questions. And uh, if you have any other questions. Uh, well, I do, and it, this is, um, if I may, the 10.4.4 um, annualized funds for new judgeships in the, in the two circuits is, is down here at 362. Is that not... Um, I don't have it in front of me, but is that not um, the same number for the 07 or? That was in our 07 uh, uh, supplemental supplemental budget. At, at what number, though, did you uh, have it? Do you? I do. It was 362.038. Uh, that, that, that's my question. If it, if, how is it in there for 07 well, and we're paying for it six months and it costs the same thing for 08? Those judges have not been put in place yet, correct? I mean, they have not. And, and that was in our 07 amended budget uh, because of a note in the tracking document. I'm, I'm, no, I'm, I'm with you, but why is it, you know, clearly they can't be hired until at least after January and, and now we're into that. If you don't mind, come around just so we can get, get you on the... I'll let Tom address that. And, and we may have we may have talked about that. I know we touched on it briefly in 07, but I'm just... 
I think this is just adding in the annualization of the 07 and then the 08 budget request has those judges built in. Well, I mean, no, what this is doing is annualizing those two circuits into 08. I understand what that's doing. My question is, why is the number the same as a, a half year of those judges that was requested at mid-year for the 07 budget? I mean, wh what does it cost for those two circuits for a year? Three, th 360, sorry, yeah. 362, 038? Yeah, that's for half a year, and then it would be double that for a full year. So you're, you're telling me to put two judges in, it costs me $600,000 a year? Yes. Yeah. Staffing. Yeah. Staffing. Now that, that that's my question. I'm, I'm secretaries, law clerks, and then operating expenses for for each judge. There's one judge, one secretary, one law. Clerk. Well, I just the way this is presented, something doesn't foot. I'm just making you guys aware of it. Because if the 362 is for half a year, when when your mid year is approved, you're not running off your mid year base budget approval. So you're only asking for another half a year. Yeah, we we expect them to work full time. Oh, I, 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 no, I, I understand, <laughs> <laughs> but get, get, get discrepancy in the way that uh, it, it's been presented here. But what we have done is ask for the 362 and the 07, and then the annualization of the full year for the judges. Right, and I, I'm not sure that's what's reflected in 08. That's right. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about that further. I just think it's, it's something we probably sounds like it needs to be doubled. Well, I was thinking about having the 07 one, so we'll, 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 we know where we're at. Well, I think it's just the way it's presented. It's the I understand. In the continuation. Right. Well, it, but what I'm getting at is your base budget that you're working off of here in 08 does not include any 07 mid-year increases. So if you add 362 to your base budget, you're not getting what would it, should that number be approved at yeah. mid-year you're not getting that so, well, I understand well, what your question yeah, is let, let's, let's move on just in the interest of time question. but that's probably something we need to, to talk about and, and yeah we'll do that great um, one, one other quick question here on the 10.4.2 uh, reduce grants to counties and, and move funds to salaries and fringes all right what, what are we doing what are we getting for that all right what that is uh, uh, where m many of the metro counties, especially the, the secretary, the judges' secretaries are paid by the, they are county employees, and so the state reimburses those counties the amount that they would have paid a uh, state somebody employee, and that's what that amount is. So you're just reclassifying. We're not changing As any I people or, or cutting it, anything for the counties. No, no, okay. it's it's just a pass through. Uh, good, good enough. Just wanted to make sure I understand. Yeah, that's what that is. Just that. Sounds like she's got a cold. <laughs> <laughs> Does the committee have any further questions? Yeah, I'm sorry, <laughs> Chairman Knox. Judge, I, I'm curious about this expenditure for the courthouse security. Um, you know, we've had this discussion, I think, uh, about you know the counties can't afford it. Uh, we hear that almost about almost everything that comes up in here. We hear the counties can't afford to do this. I'm beginning to think that what this really means is the county won't pay it. It's just not they won't, they can't afford it. It's they won't pay it. And you know, under the I think under the Constitution, the sheriff one of the main things that he's supposed to do under the Constitution is provide courthouse security, and serve warrants. That's basically his his constitutional duties, and he's a constitutional officer. I'm not sure I understand why we can't why that money shouldn't be in the sheriff's budget. I know you said ten thousand dollars a county, but you know. And maybe ten thousand dollars is a lot of money, but if you don't want a sheriff, you know, get rid of him. Don't have a sheriff. You know, if you can't afford to operate a county, get rid of the county. Don't have a county. You know, let somebody else do it that can collect the taxes that they need to operate it. Uh, but so I'm curious why we want to uh, take on a cost, you know, that's properly should be in the budget of the sheriff who's who's charged with providing that security. Whether he and whatever he has to do, if he has to buy guns for his people, get you know, get uh, uh, base, buy a stun gun, get a, you know, uniform, whatever they have to get, that's what they're supposed to do. I'm not sure why we want to, why y'all ought to be putting in your budget and, and, and worrying yourself with it, you know. I've, I mean, clearly that's what they're supposed to do, and y'all know how to enforce, 
I guess, orders on people that don't want to do what they're supposed well, to do in the court. It, it's of course that's a policy decision we recognize for, for you all, but I, I think it's a recognition that uh, uh, in some of our, uh, uh, particularly some of our rural counties, uh, uh, the judges and I, I expect the sheriffs have a tough time getting uh, uh, getting what they need, and it's just a a way to to, to assist them in uh, uh, complying with those plans. Because, as you know, Senate Bill 462 requires that the governing authority approve the plan, uh, especially if it calls for any increased expenditures. And this is just a, an effort to help in that process. Well, if they decide they can't, they don't want to do it, or don't like what your plan is, or they don't want equipment, whatever, I guess they don't get the ten thousand dollars. They would not. It would be on a grant basis, but... Now, what about when that equipment gets old? Because it seems like every time I turn around, we're replacing our equipment with something new and so on. Are we going to be responsible? Are y'all going to be responsible for making sure that kind this, of gets this is a, to pay for whatever the upgrade is? As I understand is, it, this is a so one-time on. uh, request that, we, that we're making. Okay, but my point is, they get the equipment just with this one-time allocation. They Let's say they go and buy equipment, whatever it is. When it quits working, I mean, somebody's going to plug it in, and it's, when it quits working, are they going to come back and ask you all for the money? Are they going to come to us, or, or how, what's going to happen then? Because it's not going to last forever. Well, most every government entity, I guess, wants some other government entity to pay for it, but, but uh, I, you know, I, I can't say that won't happen. Uh, our interest is in uh, uh, when we... Uh, a whole court that we've got at least a reasonable prospect of not having the folks out in the audience armed. That's what we're interested in doing, and, and trying to do that as quickly as we can. And and as I say, we still have some counties in uh, 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 that don't have any security, and uh, it's no doubt they sh they should spend the money that's needed to do that, but. I guess the problem has been that they somehow don't. I guess I'm wondering why the judge in that county doesn't issue an order saying, "Get yourself over here and fix this." Yeah. And I'm talking about now. Well, so that's a, under the Constitution. That that is a uh, uh, something that judges uh, do very reluctantly and as a last resort. Uh, and sometimes when judges have uh, done that sort of thing, they've uh, their decision has not been has been reversed by other judges, so <laughs> uh, we're reluctant to do that. And as you might imagine, it doesn't uh, uh, create uh, a lot of uh, harmony uh, locally when you when you have to do that. But that is an option that's available to the court because it has the in inherent authority and uh, uh, responsibility to make sure that it can hold court. And you can't hold court with folks shooting at you, so. Thank you. Any other questions? Tell me it's Penny. I think she's having her answer, question answered personally. Okay. Uh, are there any, uh, committee have any further questions? Any further questions? Thanks, sir. Well, thank you. We'll, and we'll get with you guys and, and work out on those numbers. I understand it's a presentation yeah, I think issue. It's the way the governor presented it where he shows what the 07 amount was and mm -hmm. then. I understand. What I think is we have to come back and fill that in at mid-year from what I'm seeing mm -hmm. at the budget. I just want to take that into consideration. We'll, we'll do that. Um, I, I, uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah. Um, we, we just want to make sure we don't have to, to go through the same dog and pony show that our friends at the Public Defenders Council are having to do this year on not funding it fully in a committee. And We, and we certainly won't, don't <laughs> want to do that either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's the reason for the questioning, just so you gentlemen know. I understand. Thank you. Thank you very much. On that, if you don't mind, Mr. Mears, I know you've got some people here and have been waiting patiently, too. We have a, a, a hall full of uh, fire chiefs and stuff that have driven in, and I just, if, if you wouldn't mind, I don't think it'll be as long. Do you mind if we go to them real quickly here? Mr. Chairman, we're at your pleasure. I, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, if we could go down, I know that we have the... Uh, the Public Safety Training Center, uh, the, uh, Firefighter Standards and Council, and, and we also have the folks from the fire chiefs and uh, firefighters. Um, if 
Mr. Mann. Yeah. I'm going to let you come forward or, or, or in, and guide me here, if you would, out of respect for, for the folks that have, have come up, um, you know, in the time. And, and again, uh, it, no disrespect to our public defenders, Mr. Mears and, and his staff, but I know we had a, a number of people, and I think they may have to, to get back and, and drive up. So can you guide me through? I know you have a presentation you need to make. I know the, the, they had an independent uh, presentation that wanted to be made uh, and that was going to involve, I think, probably an additional request of your department. Yes, so if you can guide me through getting the right people up here so, so we can free up some of these, these will, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank chiefs and let them get back uh, if they need to do sure. that. Sure. And thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Let me, let me try to put this in perspective. In my 08 budget for the training center, the only thing you have is basically 07 again with the enhancements for salary continuation uh, in the increase, the 3% workman's comp and so forth. So my 08 budget is pretty much my 07 budget. What I think you'll see from the firefighters in the room is this, that from the time fire training has been done, there's been a lot of emphasis on the technical part of fire training. And, and that pretty much is the mechanical part of putting out fires, of how to respond to fires and so forth. Very little, if any, training has ever gone to the leadership training of the fire service. And I think that's what these customers that are in here are driving. I did not put anything in my 08 budget for this, so I'm actually just responding to what the customers have done here, primarily the fire chiefs and the firefighters. And I think there is a handout. If David Wall is in here, David. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could pass this handout, this is the national model that uh, that you'll see. And if you look at the two lowest levels down there, you'll see that Firefighter 1 and Firefighter 2 are what we have routinely done for the last 20 years at the training center to get folks ready to do the technical part of the job. And as you go up above in this same model, you'll see that there are special certifications that we've also started doing uh, in the last couple of years especially, the uh, the rescue programs and so forth, especially after 9-11, there was a lot of emphasis on collapsed structures, confined spaces. We've done a lot of that training. And we'd like to thank the General Assembly for helping us with, with that last year. Then as you... I'm sorry. Um, push button. I, I want to... Did I push it? I think... Uh, yes, sir, I can hear you. Working now? He's on. Yeah. You're on. Okay. Uh, I want to commend the firefighters mm -hmm. for finally getting together and agreeing on what to teach and how to teach it and how to establish standards for themselves. For a long time, as you know, uh, firefighters here, as well intending as they were at one time, they've come to realize. Uh, as many in law enforcement have, that we need to have uh, a means by which we can continue to raise the bar. Right. And I tip my hat to the firemen who've helped make that possible. And I think it's time the state starts recognizing you. And Chairman Day, I appreciate I appreciate those comments. And I, from the seat that I sit in, I see the same thing. These are these are some self-imposed standards and self-imposed training that they want to make themselves better. And there has been, with any organization from time to time, uh, different factions that want to take off in different ways. And I think what you see here is unity among the fire chiefs and the firefighters who have come together and says we, we really need the leadership kind of training. In 20 years since we opened the training center, we've done a supervision, management, and executive development training program. And we've allowed firefighters to come in into those programs. But honestly, they were a stretch because those programs were built around law enforcement and peace officers. And when you start talking about Kelly days, when you have firefighters in there, all these guys can tell you what a Kelly day is. The, the folks that traditionally teach that don't have a clue. I mean, you can even look at Fair Labor Standards, and Training, uh, Fair Labor Standards Act. It's 212 in 28 days for firefighters. It's 171 for peace officers. So all the calculations of what goes on technically in the fire service that you're managing and supervising are different for a fire than it is for law enforcement. So all I'd like to do is to encourage you uh, to listen to these folks, and, and if they can answer questions, Mr. Chairman, uh, who would you like to hear from? I mean, you've got my support for this. 
I apologize you don't have a governor's recommendation, but again, this is customer driven. This is not something that we put in our OA budget. Well, the governor can't do everything. Absolutely. And I mean, no disrespect. When Absolutely. This, this came up after the budget. It doesn't mean that the governor. I, I, no, I'm sure he's not. I'm not going to say to that, that he's you know he's not opposed to it. Um, yes. But but that's why we have a budget process like this, and uh, we're we're happy to to look into it, um, and we'd love to. Let me first ask: does, does anybody on the committee have any questions in regards to your your OA budget okay. that the gentleman presented? I think it's it's fairly straightforward in, in what uh, what we're looking for. And I would any like questions? to tell you also that, Mr. Chairman, that I've been working with Hannah Heck, the governor's policy advisor. Right. Uh, she knows the content of this. She right. knows what's going on. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, I might add, she doesn't run us either. Oh, I understand. Sir. I understand. So we'll get that. Yeah. Um, let me, uh, Chief one. Rubin, uh, Chief of the Atlanta Fire Department, uh, Mr. Chairman, is probably one that you'd like to hear from. Thank you, Director of Committee. I'm Dennis Rubin, Fire Chief of the City of Atlanta. I happen to obviously live in the city as well. Thank you for taking time out of your incredible busy schedules to allow us to make this brief presentation. I think as Director Mann has stated, it is long overdue for us to have an executive level type training class that has been self-imposed. We know that departments such as Atlanta, about an $88 million budget, you can imagine the difficulties and intricacies that are involved in that. And this particular program will be able to reach out and touch folks in my organization that will one day become chief, right down to every volunteer fire company throughout the state. There'll be something for everyone. And this has been an area that has long been missed and long overdue and having the proper type training and program. So we would strongly urge and ask for every bit of your support and endorsement to see that this appropriation is made so that we can continue to protect this community, the entire state, of course, that is, in the best way possible. May I ask, answer any questions that you may have? Yeah, why do your fire engines have to turn their their sirens on right when they get by my bedroom window? We, <laughs> we, we apologize for that, but I, I also want to mention, because uh, Director Mann was so clear about the police agency, my son is a police officer and has been so for the Secret Service for the past nine years, and I, I shared this with the director, and I think it's probably very appropriate for the House of Representative members. There is one common trait that all firefighters and police officers have in common, and certainly, you know, it's not the hours, Mr. Dale, but... All police officers, all firefighters, wish they were firefighters. Oh, uh, I, uh, I think I think we're going to be uh, asked for equal time late, later well, on. If, uh, Mr. Chairman, there's one other comment I'd sure. have to add is that about 70% of the firefighting that's done in the state is done by volunteers. And one of the things that we need to consider is delivering this program on the weekends and delivering it in field delivery. Everybody can't take off Monday through Friday especially those who are volunteer firefighters. So, again, I would, I would encourage us to make sure that preparations are, are well enough to do that. Well, and then I want to follow up. Uh, Chairman Chambers has a question. I, I want to follow up. I know I've spoken with representatives um, uh, of the firefighters you know, uh, prior to coming in here today and, and, and heard some numbers. What, what we need to do for the committee is, is to get from you uh, the, the, a formal budget request. If you would work that through him, <clears throat> and I'm, I'm going to ask you, Director, um, to, to coordinate that for us, I understand that may be a little bit out of the process, um, but it's in the process now because that's what we're what we're asking for. Uh, you're, you're doing this, um, you know, on our on our request, and so Absolutely. we're not putting you uh, sideways with the governor okay. governor's recommendation. If you would coordinate that and get it to us as soon as we can, so oh, that yeah. we can um, work that into uh, the 08 budget, and if there's, you know. If there's a small amount of money, if it looks like this is something that's going forward, if there's something that you would need uh, and could make use of uh, to get it started as okay. we conclude this fiscal year, I'd, I'd be interested in knowing that. I, I think if we have a, a program that we're interested in doing and we're interested in starting it up, there's, it's ridiculous to pick an arbitrary date. Um, you know, now everything's subject to funding, but if, if there's something that you could make use of um, to start it, I would like to. I would like to be aware of that, Mr. Chambers. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, this doesn't actually deal with the budget, um, Director Mann, but I would like to make a recommendation to my friends, um, firefighting friends. I've got a bill that's actually sitting in House Appropriations right now until um, something's taken care of dealing with um, the indemnity fund. 
uh, for for firefighters who are, are killed or, or unfortunately die after um, returning home from a fire. Apparently, there's been some question on the constitutionality of providing um, this expansion in the indemnity fund on that. And while you have all these fine gentlemen here, would you um, maybe be able to take a field trip over to Heather's office and, and let them explain um, what exactly um, the duties of a firefighter are, the stresses uh, that come along with that, and, and how several of, of your colleagues have unfortunately um, passed on due to the stresses of coming home and, and fighting a fire. I know that Chairman Jack Hill, um, who's the Appropriations Chairman in the Senate, had this particular language attached to a, a police indemnification bill that I had last year. It did not make it through the Senate. We put it in the original bill. We, we've nicknamed it the Jack and Jill bill. Um, but we, right now it's kind of being held up as the indemnification folks are, are kind of debating this. And I'd love to take advantage of, of the numbers of you here on, on campus today to go down there and maybe have Heather connect you guys with the indemnification folks so you can explain to them um, some of the stresses that go along with the job that you perform to keep us safe. That would greatly, um, hopefully, help move this piece of legislation a little quicker than, than what it is right now. And I, I, I would just really like to be able to pass it, help you guys out, and, and be able to move it through the Appropriations Committee next week, if at all possible, in some form. And, and having your all's knowledge base here would be a great help to that. And the uh, House Bill? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. 48. Okay. 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 It, yeah, and unfortunately it's getting uh, quite an amount of debate that I'm not included on. And uh, <laughs> and so it would, I, would, I would love to take advantage of all's knowledge and, and the, your presence here today. Thank you. Chief, I think that uh, concludes it. In the interest of time, we'll move on. Let me, uh, I, I will share this with uh, Chairman Chambers and note was slipped to me uh, uh, while I was out. Um, that we have been referred that bill to this subcommittee um, for its first hearing and uh, Regardless of um, where some other folks are on it, we will have a hearing on it early next week. Um, so that's that. We, you know, I'm not going to have my progress gated by uh, somebody's inability to come up with numbers. Perhaps we'll have a hearing, and that'll help them okay. get to a final conclusion. I bet we can see a lot of these guys again. I bet that. So, Mr. So. Chairman, uh, thank you and the committee for listening to I, us. Uh, yeah, absolutely. We, we appreciate it, and we'll get back with you. And that, if you would get us sure. that information. I I, I'm going to take a bit, I think, uh, you know, Chairman's prerogative here saying, I think my fire chief's in the back back there. Chief Sanders from Alpharetta, uh, where I live. I, I appreciate you and, and uh, all the other folks coming. Uh, now, now <clears throat> y'all don't go out in the hall and believe anything that he, t he says about me. So. <laughs> well, please. Mm -hmm. Do we have it? There we go. That's Thanks a lot for all you guys coming out. Dubose's chief's here, too. Well, there you go. We appreciate it. We, we, uh, we do need to move on. We've got one other thing, but I, I do want to tell you, Chief Sanders uh, can tell you this. I used to be the mayor in Alfreda, and it wasn't a Thanksgiving or Christmas morning. I didn't wake up. Um, knowing what you guys do in the police department. I know y'all have a little friendly rivalry going there. But, you know, when we wake up in, in Georgia and we're warm, you know, waking up with our families on, on Christmas or Thanksgiving, one of the shifts is out there. I mean, every day. may not be the same folks every every Thanksgiving, but um, I think if people would, would hop out of bed one morning and ride by there or slide by after they have Thanksgiving dinner or lunch with their family, uh, and I know you, the, the departments, you know, generally do it up real well, and you guys are taken care of. But it's still, you're not with your family on that day all the time, and uh, you, you don't get told enough. We appreciate it. We appreciate. It. We're going to do what we can to help. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Director. Uh, mo yeah, mo moving on. Uh, and uh, apologize, Mr. Myers, but if you're ready, we'll, we're going to we're going to get to you at this point. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to come 
before this committee again and uh, discuss our request for the 2008 budget. Uh, Marcus Smith is our budget manager, and I've asked him to be here with me to kind of answer any questions that uh, are way over my head with regard to how this budget has been put together and how we're operating. Uh, you've been handed a what we hope to be a, a fairly simple explanation of what this budget entails. It conforms with the tracking sheet, but I think we've also tried to address the same issue that came up with the judges, and that's how to account for that uh, supplemental request that was in the 2007 budget. The Public Defender Standards Council provides services in two basic programs. The first program is the central office, which also includes mental health advocacy, the Georgia Capital Defender. In that program, Mr. Chairman, we have our training components. We have the appellate attorneys, the assistance that's provided uh, to the circuit defender offices, also our human resources, all the things that's ta that it takes to operate the system uh, from an administrative standpoint included in Program 1. Uh, the Georgia Capital Defender obviously is that part of our agency that is responsible for providing services in all death penalty cases in the state of Georgia. Program 2, it's the heart of our operation, is the Circuit Public Defender Offices. We have two Circuit Public Defenders here, David Dunn from the Lookout Mountain Circuit and Mr. Gary Bowman from Henry County. That's, that's where the services are being provided at the highest level. Uh, we also, in Program 2, handle the conflict cases because under the statutes, not only are we responsible for providing services in every instance where an individual could be sentenced, sentenced to death, and, uh, excuse me, sentenced to prison in superior and juvenile courts, we also have to provide uh, services in all conflict cases. I would have to, Mr. Chairman, with your leave, say I was a little uncomfortable talking about when the, the stun belt was being uh, discussed there. Uh, and Judge Boyette was talking about the use of this stuff. I may be the only attorney in this room, and the only person in this room, that's had to sit through several trials with my client attached to a stun belt. And 50,000 volts uh, shocking someone is, is not a pleasant thought, and I've actually seen it in, in operation. I'm not, I'm not subscribing to it, <laughs> uh, but it's, it's not a fun job. Uh, <laughs> Chairman David, I hope you can concur that that is a terrifying thought to sit there and know that you've got something strapped to your kidneys uh, that could shock you with that amount. Mr. Chairman, uh, what we've tried to do in this uh, document that we've given you is simply outline what our requests are. I know there's been a lot of discussion about the funding of the 2006-2007 budget, and I, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to work through those uh, and we'll provide you, as we have in, uh, in recently, additional information that you may request. I think the best thing I could probably do is try to answer any questions uh, that you or the other members of the committee may have about our budget request for 2008. Um, committee have any, any questions? I know we've lost some members and, and I would suspect, um, Mr. Mayor, that we're probably going to want to have you come back. I, I know uh, uh, Representative Porter is entered as, as is. Um, Chairman Ross, and, and I apologize for you guys being very patient and, and staying with us. And you, the, the meeting ran a little bit longer than, than we suspected, but uh, I, I suspect there will be additional questions. But do, do we have questions at this point? Just one, one just glancing over, and I appreciate the way you brought this down and what you said the expenses. Penny prep. Pre pre That's pressure. part of our training. Uh, That's all I had to do. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Yes, you should be on. House, and that has to do with our training program. The statute requires that we provide training to all of the circuit public defenders. We have 761 employees. Uh, almost 400 of those are attorneys across the state. And under our legislative mandate, we have to provide training. And that's the nomenclature that's used for part of that training program. Do y'all provide it through the agency or through the University of Georgia? We provide it through uh, our own agency. Uh, we use a lot of volunteer lawyers to provide to become instructors. The circuit public defenders, two of the individuals I've just uh, identified here, are trainers in, and they are part of the uh, team that trains the younger lawyers that we're bringing into the system. So we're using a lot of in-house people. Anything further, um, Mr. Mayor, I, I have 
really, you know, the questions that I've been asking, you know, of your your staff, and they've been getting me the information I need. I, I want to, I, I guess, at this time, um, you know, say here for the record, and and um, you can help me pass along to the council, and and or the learned gentleman that's uh, presiding on over the probably the most notable case in Georgia. Um, the intent of this committee, I think the intent of the combined appropriations committees in the House and the Senate as well as the uh, governor's office is to provide a constitutional level of funding for this council to do the job that they're constitutionally mandated to do that. We have every intention of doing that. That said, you, you know my concerns of us creating a budget for the amount of revenues that were going to come in rather than, than what we needed to do. Um, you, please communicate this you know, to the council yes, and, and, and to the gentleman, you know, to the extent that, that it is proper for you to have direct contact with, with the senior judge in this case, that, um, you know, the saber rattling in the paper is not going to get the budget approved any sooner. And, and quite frankly, without regard to whether we were to fund you at, at 100 percent or 200 percent of your budget, mm -hmm. this budget's probably not going to get passed and signed into law by March 15th. If he if he could show me a time in the state of Georgia where a budget has passed and been signed into law by March fifteenth, um, I think we'd all be surprised. So, and I can assure you, we're not uh, uh, moving uh, tentatively on the budget. You know, to uh, uh, bother uh, his particular courtroom or, or his situation. You know, there there are a few hundred thousand people in Georgia that are affected by peach care. And, and the, the negotiations that we're having, you know, at, at high levels within uh, the House, Senate, and, and the executive branch of the Georgia government to take care of people's business, as I'm sure he's trying to do in, in, in his courtroom. But if you could help us communicate that, that uh, if, if we can work a little bit more like your office has with this committee over the last two weeks and a little bit less through, uh, you know, the, the media, I, I think everybody might be better served. Mr. Chairman, I could not agree with you more. And if I might, just make one one quick response to that. I hope the chairman and the other members of the committee understand that we're we're under the orders of that particular judge, uh, even to the extent that I may be held in contempt because I have refused to pay expenses in that case that I thought was not appropriate. Now, I, I don't think it's going to come to that, but I, I want this committee to know we're taking our responsibility physical responsibility very seriously in that case. I think it will be worked out, but my earnest hope is that this committee understands, and I'm not trying to distance myself from our constitutional obligations, uh, but we've, we're not in league, we're not in sync with what's being spent in that case, and we've made that very clear. Uh, I'm going to stay out of the courtroom in that particular instance as much as I can because they do have a stun gun. <laughs> in, in there. But, Mr. Chairman, I will certainly do that, and I appreciate all the help that you've given us. I, I just, you know, wish that everybody could understand that, that you know, our, our view and, and look into the, the 07 mid-year budget and the 08 budget is taking everything into consideration. We have, we have a, a case of very high notoriety that's involved, but that is not um, what's driving, you know, the questions in regards or the, the concern with making sure that we we have a new we have a new process going on in Georgia that's just only a couple of years old, and we're, and we're working through that process. And but but we're not going to let a high profile case drive, you know, your budget, much less the you know the uh, budget of the entire state of Georgia. And, and again, I go back. There's not been a budget, to my knowledge, passed and signed by March 15th in a long, long, long time in the state of Georgia. So you know we're going to work on that. And, and let me let me say this. From uh, you know a citizen of Georgia, a legislator, and, and, and uh, you know chairman of this committee, as long as the speaker and, and Chairman Harbin allow me to be, we're going to back you on those things. Again, you're, you, we, we are obligated to provide a constitutional level of defense for, for any um, uh, person, you know, capital crime or otherwise. Um, but, but it is certainly um, fair for the citizens of Georgia to know uh, for what they are paying. I understand that the you know, defense strategy may need to be redacted or at some point, you know, available in the future. But I don't think you're going to get in a lot of trouble with the citizens of Georgia if you're, uh, you know, watching their watching their money. And uh, we had some folks in here earlier that probably be avail avail themselves of you should you uh, get called down in contempt. Uh, well, I, and I and appreciate we have a fleet that. of folks that work <laughs> across the street here that might be able to help you with that. I, I appreciate that very much. 
Thank you. Uh, and we probably will, again, I, I don't oh. want to blabber it at this late hour um, because we have the 07 coming in. We're probably going to ask you guys to come back, and I appreciate, again, your patience with us and, and staying here and, and coming today with that. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, we look forward to uh, we look forward to talking to you again, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Chairman, we'll be here anytime you ask us to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have one more, and I, I should have called them while we had the, the firefighters, and we have the uh, Firefighters uh, Standards and Training Council. I was going back to my uh, – I was going back to my agenda and calling an order. I should have called you, sir, while while we had uh, the folks in here. I apologize. Well, thank you. I'm Lynn Pardew, Director of Firefighter Standards and Training. I would also like to say that we thoroughly support our friends and fellow professionals in, in the training of, of the leadership of the fire service of this state as well. As Director Mann said, our budget, is, uh, our 08 budget, is fairly well straightforward. With the exception of, we've uh, asked for some additional positions, one of them being an IT specialist or a systems analyst, too, and the other being an investigator. And I'll let John Johnson explain a little bit about this. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, whichever it is now. I don't really know. Uh, I'm John Johnson. I'm the test coordinator and certification manager for the agency. Um, pretty much our role and responsibility in state government is to uh, recognize and certify volunteer firefighters, part-time and full-time firefighters. Uh, we also certify the operation of fire departments. Uh, we're one of the smallest agencies in the state. Uh, we have a total staff of eight. That includes the director, myself, uh, three administrative assistants, uh, secretarial positions, and then other program coordinators. Um, with Senate Bill 169 being passed into law in 2004, it kind of broadened the uh, functions and powers of our council, and along with those powers came uh, the ability to make sure that fire departments and fire personnel are meeting certain requirements. And with that new legislation and new authority of the council, we have found a need of an investigator that we've never had in our agency that would go into the public, into the fire departments, and uh, follow up uh, situations that may arise with fire departments not meeting the requirements or with fire service personnel not meeting their certification requirements. So the governor uh, has recommended that we uh, be funded with those positions and we would appreciate your support in that matter as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, The papers that were handed out to you are uh, the white papers with some additional information for your uh, purview. If you have any questions of that, uh, we would be glad to, to answer those questions at this time. If I may, the Please. systems analyst uh, is a IT position, whereas in the past, our previous IT person was our director, and he suddenly passed away uh, August 15th of 2004. So as small of an agency as we had, our IT guy died. We lost a director, a friend, and our IT person. So, so with previous funding, as you noticed, the one-time funding on our budget there that we were allowed uh, $22,000 to move forward and upgrade our IT positions and to move toward web-based testing, uh, sharing uh, fire department compliance and information with the individuals as well as the fire departments. We need this IT person too. So the governor recommended that and we, we absolutely appreciate that and, and we're asking you guys to support it as well. Okay. Thank you. I think the committee is you and I uh, <laughs> at this point. <laughs> amazing, what you, amazing what you lose around here when it gets lunchtime. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you notice the firefighters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's why I had to get there. Well, there that's you go. Uh, I hope I don't need anything from Ms. Heck later on this year. Um, yeah, I, th- I think you're, uh, I mean, I think your requests are, are um, very well compartmentalized and, um, and defined. Uh, Ms. Chambers, do you have a question? I love firefighters. That's all I have to say. We do, too. (laughs) (laughs) And police officers and troopers, too. Well, I appreciate you guys coming out. Um, Make sure, and I I know we do, uh, I do um, have, uh, uh, I don't know if I have an email on there or not, but I'll make sure I um, get an email so that we can contact you because I know that you have some additional um, items on the white paper that we're not recommending funding, and I appreciate you guys providing that. That's mm-hmm. one of the things that I asked uh, all the departments to do for this committee is to make sure we knew what your total requests are, and we're going to give you an, you know, an opportunity to um, you know, talk about that a little bit later as well. Sure. If there are no further questions.
Move adjournment, Mr. Chairman. Well, I will uh, not entertain that motion at this time. But, uh, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, no. it, it, we, we will, uh, if there's no uh, further business before the uh, committee, we will stand adjourned. If there's no objection, we are adjourned.